Um, so uh, me and Leah are going to be talking about formal verification uh, of Solidity contracts and a little bit smart contracts in general. Um, some of the ways in which the language uh, and the compiler can assist in doing this process. And uh, also talking about ACT, which is a um, language for specifying the behavior of smart contracts. Uh, and I'll try to keep this relatively uh, brief, leaving a lot of room for discussion um, about what can be uh, done to improve the workflow as, as it is right now. So um, to begin, I'll just uh, position this, um, this question of how to specify the behavior of solidity functions in context, um, sort of uh, opening up for the discussion. Uh, one way in which you can do this is to um, use asserts um, directly in the function source. And um, if you uh, are not using annotations, but are rather referring to the variables directly in the Solidity code, this is how that can look like for a transfer function. You would be asserting that the um, relevant variables are changing. Uh, uh, expressed in pre and post conditions, and it can look something like this. Um, but if you don't want to do it directly in the function source, an alternative would be to have um, like a, a wrapper function. And this relates again to the um, discussion we just had on uh, conventions for testing frameworks, um, because this looks very similar to how you would write a test uh, if you are writing your tests in, in Solidity, uh, at least. Um, and yeah, I think it's sort of straightforward what's going on here. You, you do some uh, caching of variables before you execute a certain function, and then you compare those values according to some condition against the state that you get after executing that function. And then there is the alternative of specifying the behavior in a language, uh, in a different language altogether. And so here, um, this language is ACT, which I'll be um, going a little deeper in uh, during the next couple of minutes. Um, so I think this is uh, a good example to just get a flavor of what the um, syntax um, can look like if you want to really highlight everything that's going on inside a transfer uh, function. So it should be noted that this function makes um, a little more of a precise claim than the previous two. Uh, in the previous two, we're really only talking about the updates that happen to the balance of mapping. Whereas here, we're also saying um, under which precise conditions these updates are happening. We're saying that call value should be zero since this is a non-payable function. Um, and we're doing the um, we're doing the check that uh, is is done implicitly here by the, the safe map. Um, and we're also immediately forced to consider the edge case of what happens when um, you're actually transferring to yourself. So in aspects, you are forced to split up um, every claim that refers to mappings, depending on whether you have a collision in those mappings or not. So uh, I'll get more into that in the next slide, I think. But let's just talk a little bit about the different approaches and, and sort of the, the pros and cons uh, for them. So for the first two, obviously a big uh, advantage is that it's integrated and the, uh, the developer doesn't need to learn an additional language, however obscure you may find it, but can just work directly in um, Solidity. 
And uh, if you're writing your properties of the function directly in the source, um, things are also pretty tra transparent or auditable by people reading uh, the implementation because they'll um, see your claims about what the uh, behavior is supposed to be. And they can either test it for themselves with their own frameworks, or they can just sort of get a um, better understanding maybe of what this function is supposed to do if they prefer um, reading this, this functional uh, description uh, over the uh, sort of implementation that is given. Um, an advantage of, of the, the latter two is having this wrapper spec for the uh, uh, specification in a language completely outside of Solidity um, is that it's more agnostic to the particular implementation. Um, if you were to change how the nature of, of transfer were implemented, you could probably still reuse the same testing function um, and even this uh, spec. But uh, if you want to change how the um, implementation um, does what it's uh, doing according to the spec, then uh, you'll be forced to rearrange your spec too, probably, or you'll be forced to rearrange the claims that you're making inside the implementation. Uh, and it can get uh, sort of hairy because now you're editing both um, what the contract is actually doing and the description of what it should do uh, in the same um, in the same development process. Um, and so another uh, advantage of of using a different language that is designed to um, design for the purpose of specifying smart contracts is that you have these, you can make decisions that are more um, aligned with um, how functions are described um, independent of how they are implemented. Um, you don't really need to care much about uh, what is the most gas efficient way to do something but you just want to describe the results of uh, whatever implementation you might have. Um, and also, as I mentioned, there are um, certain features of the ACT language that are uh, designed to lean the developer into um, making sure that they really think about all of the edge cases that may um, exist in the implementation um, and are forced to think about them explicitly. Um, also, when, when one has an outside language that sort of exists beyond the scope of the EVM, one can talk about um, all of the variables involved uh, as true integers um, and not just uh, EVM uh, words that wrap around um, to, to the 256. As we can see here on the last line of the if and only if block, um, we're able to express that the addition of value to balance sub two um, should not overflow. Uh, and we can express that by explicitly um, giving the bound of two to the 256, even though that is uh, essentially unexpressible, uh, at least in this form, uh, if we are uh, only uh, allowed to use um, uh, bitwise uh, addition. Uh, yeah, some additional points there that I think are obvious. Uh, one big um, approach that I uh, didn't mention here is, of course, if you do the sort of salty verify um, approach where we use annotations instead of uh, using the source code directly. Um, so to summarize the the um, the essence of ACT. Um, it is designed to be a human readable function, a uh, human readable um, specification language in which you can express function descriptions and contract invariants, get to that uh, later, which from which you can generate proof obligations to multiple backends. So there's a large number of um, formal verification tools that are emerging. Well, there has been for a while, but they're getting uh, very good right now. and. Uh, 
it's really curious to try these different tools out because they have certain strengths and weaknesses and are also operating in slightly different domains. Um, and so ACT can be used to try these, test these tools against each other and compare the results, um, but also utilize the different tools that are targeting different domains. So when you're working with these source level uh, specifications or, or development tools, um, you're always at risk of the uh, compiler doing something that you're unaware of or uh, behaving unexpectedly. And this is sort of a blind spot for the formal verification process. But then on the other hand, if you're doing bytecode verification, it takes a very long time and it can be difficult to do stuff like contract requirements. So ACT is an attempt of modularizing uh, the process of uh, doing formal verification for smart contracts and being uh, interoperable with these different backends. So um, our first couple of plans uh, for different backends we'll be targeting um, is uh, a cock backend for um, claims that are difficult to prove using SMT solvers uh, and really require manual proofs. Um, SMT queries for doing contract invariance and, and certain uh, checks that are easier to do in the SMT setting. And for bytecode verification, um, we already have a, a prototype of uh, exporting proofs to KVM, and there's also an HVM uh, backend in the works, which will be uh, faster in, in many cases, but slightly less general. Um, and so to go a little deeper into this point about the uh, modularity of, of proving tools and verification um, setups. Uh, here is a more in-depth uh, example where we are expressing a uh, invariant in the constructor of the token. So um, this also touches on a, on a point that I'll get to a little later, uh, where here we have this sum construct, which is which is not native to um, to solidity or even something that could generate any reasonable uh, bytecode, but it's very useful for formulating uh, properties about what we expect our uh, contracts to do. Um, so yeah, here's here's more of an example, and I guess uh, one point that I'm trying to make here is that. Um, I think this language is pretty similar to how you may uh, express the nature of what you want a token to do um, in a setting like you're writing an ERC. Um, when I recently was uh, writing an, an ERC for, for permit, um, I wrote the description and the specification of how this new um, function and token extension is uh, supposed to behave in a language that was very similar to this because I think that it really uh, allows for people to make their own implementations and, and have freedom in how they decide to uh, optimize their particular behavior while still being completely unambiguous in terms of uh, what the function should do. So as a result of this, it means that if, if you're writing uh, an ERC in this language, not only will it be uh, clear for people to uh, read and implement, but it can also be something that you can use to test um, and formally verify that um, ERCs are actually implemented in the correct way. Um, yeah, so here's a little bit more about how um, it actually works. Is there a question or just a sigh? I'll keep going then. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I'm just going to say what I said before, that, that uh, uh, the, the, the design decisions of ACT are made in such a way that you should be able to um, really think about all of the edge cases. There was actually a question, Martin. Oh, there was a question. Should I go to the Gitter chat or? Uh, you like someone raise their hand here. Who was it? Jocelyn? Uh, it was me. Yeah. Um, so, what are the limitations of the language? 
Um, can I, for example, describe uh, my property over a set of function? Like something should hold uh, after calling F1 and F2 or something like that? Uh, yeah, so we are, so actually the, the, the syntax that you saw here uh, of invariant is a um, special case of an invariant that holds over all functions, but there's okay. also a syntax where you can do invariant of and then a okay. list of, of functions. So, so yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Um, okay, I set this. Right, so, so here is, I guess, um, a more concrete um, way of, of expressing what I mean by uh, doing this modular approach to, to verification. Uh, if we take a, uh, an example smart contract, this one, this is going to be a, a contract that I now only express in terms of accent text. Uh, but you can probably imagine the, the solidity implementation. It should be fairly straightforward to see. So we have some sort of, um, we have three variables that it's dealing with, X, Y, Z, um, and an invariant that we expect to hold from them. Um, if we have two functions, uh, which simply update two of our uh, variables involved by multiplying it with a scalar, either uh, multiplying X and Z using a function F or, um, uh, updating y and z using the function g, then this generates a cog theory which is uh, beyond the scope uh, and sort of agnostic about the blockchain setting that this smart contract is operating in. And so it has sort of the essence of this contract um, and it allows you to um, get all of the relevant definitions uh, over which you can do the proof of safety that that you've expressed in the um, in the act syntax. So all of the boilerplate that comes with generating the definition and the theorems here um, of the smart contract involved would be um, generated automatically, and you simply insert the proof. Uh, I skipped ahead a little bit. Let's see if there was something we missed. Yeah. So. I guess I showed it now by example rather than explaining the, the details of, uh, of what I meant to say. I'm, I'm essentially saying that usually when you're doing a formal verification, uh, this sort of end-to-end -end formal verification process where you have some uh, smart contract business logic, sometimes people refer to, or high-level specification, um, which you expect certain properties to hold up you can make proofs uh, on a high level which aren't referring to any bytecode specific or blockchain specific parts um, and then you can also perform the bytecode level proofs uh, with the same specification if you're using act so this refinement that the higher level properties that you're proving also hold of the lower level bytecode that you uh, get from the compiler is more of a property that either holds or doesn't hold the back. Well, hopefully it holds if, if we do everything right, uh, but it's not something that you need to do for each project. Right, so um, here's just a little uh, list of some motivating properties or motivating examples for why you may sometimes require something more complex than uh, just SMT solvers for proving uh, correctness of your smart contracts, simply because there are certain properties of smart contracts that that um, express the correctness of them that are too difficult for SMT solvers to do. Uh, and this is a good example, um, which you can actually prove using SMT theories, um, depending on which strategy you take to to doing it. But um, I think uh, doing something more complex would be out of scope for this uh, time. Okay, so in conclusion, leaving more uh, time for questions than, and, and discussion rather than just presentation. Um, in doing ACT and in writing specifications of smart contracts using ACT, you get this language improver agnosticism. 
So you can compare different provers, but you can also compare different implementations of the same uh, logic or different um, languages uh, writing the same smart contract. So you can compare the bytecode generated by, for uh, bytecode say, versus the bytecode generated by Solidity against each other. Um, actually, just just as a note on that, um, this was the subject of a presentation that I did at last DevCon where we had. Um, similar to the uh, previous slide, a, a specification for uh, an ERC-20. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the talk was more of a hackathon where people were competing to make the most gas efficient ERC-20. Uh, and this is sort of a safe way to do these um, gas golf competitions because now you know that not only can you have these uh, crazy optimized versions that are supposed to do something and you sort of uh, have some tests we you have to check it against, but you can actually do formal verification against the bytecode that is generated in the end. So it's a very, um, it's a very good uh, measure to have if you're uh, really keen on uh, making crazy optimizations. Um, yes, yeah, so this is ACT. Please come to the Gitter channel to discuss it if you're interested. Um, and just to, to keep this sort of focused on, on Solidity, here are just some uh, pointers that, um, uh, well, an ask really um, to, uh, to Sol C and um, the developers of, of maybe something that was discussed already uh, during the debug session. I'm not sure. I wasn't able to attend that, unfortunately. Um, but the ask is essentially uh, this, and it's related to bytecode verification. Uh, basically, the, the situation is that um, when you're doing bytecode level proofs, often you have a pretty performance heavy duty because you're symbolically executing EVM code and there's a lot of things that can happen. And um, in order to scale this process, uh, what one wants to do is to reuse proofs about subsets of bytecode uh, as lemmas in other proofs. So if you already know that a particular internal function can be summarized um, to do this, then you can reuse it whenever you get to that part of the bytecode. Um, but this is sort of tricky to do um, uh, using Solidity right now because um, it requires a lot of manual labor to extract the relevant, relevant pieces of bytecode. Uh, the AST really helps and the source map really helps, but what would help even more is to have um, PC values directly uh, from uh, specifically internal functions uh, and modifiers. Um, so this is my ask. I have a method of, of extracting it now, which involves, you know, combining the AST and the, and the source map, but it's very unreliable. And uh, I think direct support for this would be beneficial for other tools as well. Um, yeah, are there any other things I want to say? Not really anything more than what I said here. Oh, well, maybe one thing. Um, variable location um, at, at function heads and, and loops uh, could also be, be valuable. Okay. Can you be a bit, a bit more specific on that? So what, also on the PC values, what exactly do you mean? So uh, essentially what I have been doing before is um, when doing a proof about an internal function is that you go to the piece of value that represents the jump test that this function uh, begins. And usually if it is a stack-based function, you have the arguments organized in the stack in reverse order to uh, how they appear in the function declaration. Um, and then you can do your proof like that. It becomes more complicated if you have a function which involves uh, memory and, and also if the function comes from a different contract that has been imported somehow uh, or inherited from, then uh, getting the, the, uh, the location of how these functions relate to the bytecode um, is kind of tricky. Is that clear, uh, Chris, or can I clarify something?
Okay, that's so stupid. Why is there even a hang up button? <laughs> Sorry. Jocelyn is uh, raising his hand. Uh, may yeah. I just uh, say something to, to finish up on that? So um, you would like a mapping from probably AST ID of all functions to the entry point as a bytecode offset. Yes. Um, yeah, okay. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Francie, can you direct uh, or, or sort of say who? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Jocelyn is uh, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, nice talk. So could you describe uh, when ACT start and stop? Typically, like, is it um, a DSL with a JSON output? Or does it do like more stuff like checking if the variable um, like if the act variable are the same as the contract variable and stuff like that? Um, so it is right now a uh, generating um, from from the specification language a JSON output, which or sort of intermediate um, representation, which can be used for um, to, to plug into different backends. Um, and also we'll be supporting some backends internally without Going via this, uh, this AST, uh, but there's also the option of. Um, so to answer your question, I think it's about uh, whether the source code needs to be available uh, for these proofs to go through uh, or not, or at least th that seems to be part of the question. And the answer is for some backends it will be necessary, um, or for some backends you will be required to do additional work if the source code is not present. Um, so a newly introduced feature, or even new, but a, a feature now of the Solidity compiler is that you can extract the location of, of um, storage variables. And then it's very, very nice to write specifications like this where you want to um, do by the verification proofs because you can simply refer to them by the name. And if you have the source code, you know what those uh, storage locations are going to map over to in terms of EVM locations. Um, so if you don't have the um, bytecode, or if you don't have the source code of a contract and you still want to make this bytecode level proof, you would need to be more explicit about where these different locations live and so on. And if I have the source code, um, the JSON output is going to have directly the storage location? Uh, yes, there's, there's a way to uh, include that there. Thanks. Um, 